So this would have been the best video for me to wear my Dwayne Hoover like loser t-shirt, but I don't have it with me. It's at home and I am, in case you can't tell, I'm, I'm in Dawn. But I have my Rambu t-shirt instead because why not? But Little Miss Sunshine. <sighs> This film really holds like a special place in my heart and for like so many reasons. I don't really know if I can even articulate all of the reasons. I just, just really love it. But one of the reasons is what this video is about. A quick little disclaimer, although this video is about like the introduction in the first few minutes of the movie, um, there will be some like kind of spoilers. So like if you haven't seen it, maybe watch it first and then come to this video. So this is a film with six different main characters, all intertwined into a family with one common goal throughout the plot, which is to get all of to California in time to compete for the Little Miss Sunshine pageant. And yet, despite that overarching storyline that they all have in common, this film is able to beautifully manage the individual family members and their character arcs and see them fully through in a way that flows well and causes just really like no confusion for us as a viewer. And what I've noticed is that the first four minutes or so, that short part of the film that takes place before the title is shown, serves as a perfect introduction to all these characters and their different story arcs. This video essay will be a short breakdown of those first four minutes, analyzing how its visual and audio elements work together to create a perfect opening for the film. The film opens to show an extreme close-up of Olive's eyes, her young, hopeful eyes with her glasses reflecting what she's watching on TV. As the film focuses mostly on her desire to compete in the Little Miss Sunshine pageant, it's only appropriate that we start off by seeing the world through her eyes. We're able to see that young Olive is watching a recording of the moment that the Little Miss America pageant winner is announced. More precisely, we see that she's watching it so that she can memorize how the pageant winners react to the good news. She pauses, rewinds, and rewatches the big moment, mirroring the pageant winner's expression of excitement and joy. Olive is practicing for when she will win a pageant because, of course, this is her current goal in life. She dreams of being a pageant winner, of having that same moment that these women that she's watching on her TV have had. While we're still looking at Olive on screen, we hear Richard speak. Hearing Richard while we're still watching Olive is important because it connects the two characters. This connection shows how Richard's mindset has affected his daughter. While we're still looking at this impressionable seven-year-old girl mimicking the pageant winners that she looks up to, we hear these words that he has undoubtedly said in front of her and even to her countless times. She dreams of being a winner like these pageant winners, not because she has high aspirations of winning, but because her father has always taught her that that's what she's supposed to be looking forward to in life. To Olive, it might seem like she has no choice but to avoid being a loser. And of course, to her, that means becoming a pageant winner. At her young age, she feels like she has no other option. She's already living under high pressure put onto her by her father. Our first sight of Richard is with him in a tight frame, brightly illuminated with the stark white background. We're looking up at him, which suggests a power imbalance that has him as the holder of more power. Next, we get a wide shot that contextualizes the environment he's in, while also not giving too much away. We still have some vagueness as to the room he's in, because all we can tell is that he's on some sort of stage. One might question whether he's a professor giving a lecture to a crowded room, as again, his elevated position from the last shot suggests that he has some sort of power. As he's fully engrossed with what he's saying, we look at him as an onlooker from the side of the stage. He speaks passionately to his yet unseen audience about how they could be winners if only they'd follow his nine-step refuse to lose program. From this point, it's easy to be immersed in his fantasy to agree with him that maybe, just maybe, we could elevate ourselves from being a loser to becoming winners. Once again, in the next shot, we are looking up at him as if he's big and powerful and we are the ones who have much to learn from him. The last shot before we finally get a glimpse of who he's speaking to is almost from the point of view of an audience member, except that we are on eye level with Richard. It's as if we're being warned of the revelation that is to come, as if we're finally on a level playing field with him, looking him dead in the eyes as we slowly push forward, getting closer and closer and making it more difficult to hide from the lies that he is telling himself about how he's a winner, that he's attaining his goals of success, that he's just this close to getting his book deal, that he's making wise decisions and putting so much of his money and time into his nine-step program. And then, finally, 
we see the audience. As the lights turn back on, literally shedding light on the true situation, we see that there are only 10 people scattered around the room, and we look down on not only the audience, but also on Richard. For now, we see that Richard truly doesn't have as much power as he would like to believe that he has. Unlike the transition between Olive's introduction and Richard's, there's a sudden hard cut between Richard's and the next, that of his stepson, Dwayne. This only highlights the separation Dwayne feels from his stepfather, and since the transition from Olive to Richard was achieved via a sound bridge, this lack of auditory transition between the two illustrates the silence that Dwayne lives in compared to the rest of his dysfunctional family members. His introduction as a whole is essentially a short montage of him working out alone in his bedroom. Although it may not seem like it, this montage actually details who Dwayne is quite well. As this is a character who spends most of his screen time not talking, there's no truer way to gain insight into who he is than seeing how he expresses himself through the way he decorates his bedroom or even just the possessions he has lying around his room. In the first shot, there's a jump rope and some barbells on the floor. This shows that even though he is unique in the fact that he's like fully committed to this vow of silence, which, you know, that's not something you're gonna really see most teenage boys doing, he's still not as unique as he probably thinks he is. I mean, he's still just a teenage boy with a messy room. The second shot shows the Nietzsche tapestry on his wall. Also, sorry if I don't know how to pronounce Nietzsche. <laughs> who we'll later find out is his inspiration and the reason he took a vow of silence in the first place. In that same shot, we can see various clutter on his bedstand, including a model airplane. This, of course, alludes to the fact that he dreams of becoming a pilot someday. As he does pull-ups on his doorframe, the camera pans across his room, showing more of how it's decorated. Stacks of CDs and a couple speakers occupy his dresser on the left of him, as does a poster of an airplane, continuing to the illusion of his aspirations for flying. To the right, there's a long piece of paper entitled Flight School. The next and final shot shows him adding a day and then immediately crossing it off, showing that he's counting down the days until he can attend flight school. This adds detail to how desperate he is not only to become a pilot, but also to be able to move out of his home. What's most important to me, however, is the final glimpse we get of Dwayne before we move on to the next introduction. And that final glimpse is a lingering shot of him looking at himself in the mirror. This character is the epitome of self-reflection. For nine months, he's spoken to nobody except himself, basically. He knows himself more than anybody does, and more than he knows anybody else. And so he takes a long look into the mirror and sees the reflection of the person that he's spent the most time holding conversation with for almost a year. And of course, that's a long time for anybody, but especially like a 15-year-old boy, that's that's a good, that's one fifteenth of his life. Once again, there's no transition between Dwayne's introduction and his grandpa Edwin's, only a hard cut to his grandpa closing the bathroom door. And once again, this makes sense. Edwin is Richard's father, and so he's technically Dwayne's step-grandfather. Of course, they all live together as a family, and from knowing Olive's age, it's clear that Richard and Edwin have been in Dwayne's life from the time when he was a young kid. But it's also obvious that Dwayne dislikes Richard, and by extension, his grandpa. And as mentioned before, he just generally feels distance from the rest of his family, and so to convey that, there's no transition to connect him with Richard or with Edwin. Just a sudden, abrupt cut. There's a few shots of Grandpa Edwin closing, locking the door, and then walking over to the bathroom counter in order to prepare his illicit drugs. What's interesting is we don't see his face until he's ready and lifting the drugs up. As he takes the drugs in, we see him in detail through this close-up shot. The next shot is a, is a bit wider, and we see most of his body as he sniffs satisfyingly, gets up, and walks past the camera to sit on the toilet and relax. What I like about this shot is, although he's technically out of frame, we're still able to see him clearly through the mirror. But instead of watching him look at himself in the mirror, just like we did with Dwayne previously, we see him stare off into space, still reacting to the drugs that he's just inhaled. It's an interesting parallel. This is a man who doesn't feel himself until he's able to get high. And we see him through this mirror, a reflection of the person who he's become, and we see the effect that this habit has on him. This habit that will eventually lead to his demise, unfortunately. 
In introducing Cheryl, we get an auditory transition once more. As Grandpa Edwin sits in the bathroom, we hear her yelling over the phone with her husband Richard. She's panicking and she's smoking a cigarette despite her protest at her husband that she isn't smoking. She's rushing to pick up her brother and she's worried and she's arguing with Richard and honestly, it's probably the most accurate way to introduce this poor stressed out mother. The opening shot for her introduction lingers on her holding a lit cigarette as she argues with Richard over the phone. It then cuts to a close-up of her tired face as she takes a drag of her cigarette, letting go of the wheel for a dangerous few seconds in order to do so. This highlights how important the relief she feels from smoking is for her. She's driving for her life, rushing to pick up her brother after he survived a suicide attempt, but she's still willing to risk death for a brief few seconds in order to get like the relief that she needs from smoking because she's in a panic and she needs it to calm down. Yet, as she insists to Richard that she's not smoking, she throws the cigarette out the window and continues driving. This shows that she is trying to break this habit, but also that she's struggling with it due to the extreme stress she has in her day-to-day -day life, specifically with her husband in this moment. This also sets the stage for the constant arguing that she and Richard are going to have throughout the whole movie. Finally, as Cheryl hangs up with Richard and shuts her flip phone with annoyance, we cut to see Frank alone in his hospital room. As seen before with Dwayne, there is no transition because Frank is at a point in his life where he doesn't really feel close with anybody. It's also apparent throughout the film that he just hasn't been in his sister's life or that of her family's lives for quite a while as he's surprised to see how big Olive's gotten and he doesn't know anything about Dwayne's vow of silence even though it's been nine months. The framing of this shot also illustrates just how alone Frank feels. Him in his wheelchair staring desolately out the window makes up a majority of the visual weight in this frame, and yet he sits in the far left of the shot, leaving all the rest of it to feel empty and unbalanced in comparison. It almost gives you a sense of yearning for somebody, anybody, to walk through the door and fill up that empty space. And in this desire, we find ourselves sympathizing with Frank, feeling discomfort at the mere fact that there's nobody else in the room with him. The opening of this film finishes off with a close-up of Frank's face, and finally, the title slowly comes across the screen, wrapping it all up and putting a nice little bow on our introductions to the entire family. And there you have it. That's why I believe that Little Miss Sunshine has pretty much the perfect opening possible. <laughs> In these short four minutes, you're able to get a full like introduction to each family member and you're able to know everything you need to know in order to watch the film, like all the context that you need to watch the film. And it's all done without being obnoxiously like, obviously in your face about it, without anybody just like overtly telling you, yes, this person is feeling this way, this person has done this thing. It's all done. I want to say so textually, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but yeah. I mean, literally three months later, um, editing this video, the word I was looking for was exposition. There's no exposition. Everything is shown subtly and through context clues and stuff. Nobody's just like in your face about um, how these characters are as individuals. Back to me three months ago. Finally, if you haven't seen this film already, do it, <laughs> please please do it. You're on YouTube already. Just like search up Little Miss Sunshine. It's free with ads. It's also on Hulu with ads, of course. Just, just, just go watch it. It's so good. It's so good. It's one of my favorite films of all time. And yeah, thank you for watching this video. I hope this was interesting. It was really fun for me to make. And don't forget to subscribe as well because it's free. It's free. Might as well. Help a film student out, please. <laughs> Okay, until next time, bye.